Afternoon, Hona. It's, yeah, it's, it's really good to have you today and I know you are super busy. We thank you for coming. This, this, this episode is really a heart-to-heart -heart session where we, we really want to know um, two things. What's really happening and how everyone can join together to help. And I guess I, I really would like to start off with, so where are we now from your point of view? I think coronavirus is here to stay with us. What we can hope for now is for all the developed countries, all developing countries with the means, the skill sets, knowledge and wisdom to push it all the way back, mm -hmm. such that we have a certain level of functioning within different parts of the world. Yeah. And then for the rest of the other countries that are struggling with it, we hope that these developed nations will go in, pour resources, software as in the people, to actually push the virus out. Eventually, I think the one that will save the day will be vaccines or treatment modalities which are undergoing trials at this point in time. It will take probably at least another 12 to 18 months before we see the virus whimpering away. But for the next six months, it will really be the entire birthing process. All of us will have to go through this ups and downs, these tribulations and trials, and it will be undulating for the next six to nine months. We're actually not even clear what's happening exactly where you mentioned the less developed and developing countries, because there's an explosion in the developed countries. How do you see this panning out and where is everyone at there? How the world has to tackle it is to do it the same way as how Wuhan and Hubei did it. It's going to be a complete lockdown, with minimal interactions with the rest of the people. This is just only the governmental mm. aspect. Mm. People must go down to search, isolate and quarantine mm. infected individuals or those who have exposed to the virus. Mm. Only with these two tough measures will the coronavirus be controlled. But in the case of Italy, they were not prepared when the virus struck. Mm. The Spanish as well as the French, they were not ready as well. On top of that, all the hospitals were never prepared for an outbreak like coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Compared to the Asia-Pacific countries of Taiwan, Singapore, China, Hong Kong, which had SARS, yes. SARS became a blessing yes. because it was the preamble to come, which is the coronavirus yes. COVID-19. So when in Europe, they didn't think it would strike them. So when it struck them, it looked as if it was a sneak attack and very soon the virus was penetrating every single city, province in the whole country. And we will see this continuing until they get their act together. Act together means a country where there's a strong governmental will, where they have a good team to search, quarantine, uh, search, identify, and isolate and quarantine. You need to good medical care facilities and healthcare doctors with the proper equipment that can look after themselves. And the last is actually a cooperative citizens. Mm. Citizens that trust the government to exercise the right decisions, make the right uh, plans and uh, actions for the whole country. Only when all these four come into play can we effectively control the virus. Okay, in other words, you're really, really saying that even though vaccines are in the background, um, even treatment protocols, but the main thing, this virus needs to be contained and can be stopped if everyone works together with the same direction in short. Spot on. We need to be in unison, we need to be one. The one is where the virus is the enemy and ourselves on the other. We have to consciously work together to block the virus. Only then can we overthrow the virus. Hi Danny. Hi Dee. Good to see you. It's been some time. It's some time. Likewise, likewise. I really like to hear from you. I mean, today is our session on Heart to Heart, meaning we can share anything that we feel will help anyone out there. Mm. Can I just start off by asking you, what are you actually seeing out there right now? I think we are seeing people who are struggling because uh, there's a lot of fear. 
I think this fear has got to do with uh, one uh, personal uh, impact where you don't know or we don't know whether we ourselves may come down okay, with the COVID-19 infection. I think the other one is uh, loved ones. Uh, and I think it goes right down to even our work uh, occupation because uh, some people are suffering because of it. You know, they have to shut down or the business has been very much reduced. I think the biggest stress and the biggest frustration is this, right? Uh, we really don't know how much longer this is going to be. You know, in, in most cases when you have a problem, okay, we can define the problem and we can kind of see, you know, maybe what are the possible solutions and outcomes. Uh, you know, but I think in this particular case, uh, there isn't, there is a textbook, there isn't anything that's going to say, you know, it's going to go off in a month, two months, six months, you know, it's going to be here to stay. What do we actually do? Yeah. And I think people are all going through that uh, uncertainty and I think that, that gives a lot of fear. Can you give me some examples from what you see in your families, schools? When, for example, you get a lockdown, uh, you know, it simply means, right, you know, you don't leave home, right? You know, and people don't live in big homes where you have, you know, the one, two stories, you, know, you stay on the first level, I stay on the second. Most people stay in compartment, or HDBs and flats, and, and, and we are going to be in each other's space, right? Yeah. And, and if we have problems, okay, that's going to be kind of like very much more attenuated. We're going to feel extremely stressed out with a person that you know, we find difficult to communicate with, a person that we find we are impatient with, you know, and so on and so forth. And that will only multiply the whole effect when we begin to sit down, say, for a week, two weeks, a month. You know, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. Yeah? So emotionally, psychologically, you know, financially, you know, socially, professionally, we're all stretched. And when that happens, uh, the body and the system and the mind and the, 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 the person can't handle that. We know many, many families that are actually quite stuck in a very small environment. Can you give us some ideas how to help all this? I think, I think one good thing or one good way is to create space. Yeah. Yeah? When I say space, you know, I, I know sometimes as you said, you know, it can be quite tight to space. You know, yes. Especially if you stay in a smaller unit, a smaller house or whatever and you've got more people in. But perhaps you know, we can mentally say, all right, you know, uh, this particular space, when I need to work, this particular space, when I need to rest, okay, it's actually my space, this is your space, you know, and we begin to respect those boundaries. So, you know, we kind of create new demarcations of, uh, you know, within the home, a certain place that we want to spend our time or spend our energy and all that, uh, to be able to, to get things done, perhaps, you know. I think also space for me also uh, represents you know, a time alone, a, a time to recharge, you know, the capacity to be able to sit down and say, look, you know, uh, I need a break from everything, I need a break from you guys, you know. I think a lot of uh, home mothers, for example, you know, one of the things, I mean, even before all of this, you know, part of their stress is like, you know, can I take a break from my children, you know. Uh, and all. So I think that kind of space, if we can try to creatively look into that, that will help actually. So you're saying just create those spaces. So for example, if you need to do your office work, have a space, kids, you go that side, husband and wife, we split up, grandpa, grandma, you stay on one side. But when we come together, we have the semblance of normality, eat mm. together, but then we go back out to our space. Is that mm. what you're trying yeah. to do? And also because, also because this has been imposed very suddenly. Uh, human behaviour requires time to adapt to change. So if we gradually go into a phase where we can see more of each other, that's great, you know. And I think for some families that may have had some struggles, uh, it actually yeah, it actually kind of totally blows this thing apart and it allows, I mean, it creates a whole lot of tension, a whole lot of problems, yeah. And, and hence, we need to be very careful because uh, learning from other countries that locked down, uh, they have actually had a lot of family struggles. Yes. Yes. Hi, Anne. Hi, Dee. It's good to touch base at this time. Yeah, nice to be here today. You know, in this session of Heart to Heart, for the COVID crisis, we, we really want to just focus on the healthcare workers and what you see. You're a mother, you're artist, you're poet, you're a doctor. You came out of your sabbatical just to help out. What are you actually seeing there? 
my husband is a GP yes. and I heard from him that you know the clinics on primary care clinics on the ground the GP clinics actually are quite short uh, short staff also um, I also have some close friends working in the emergency department so I think I'm quite I'm still quite in touch with a lot of my colleagues in the hospital even though I no longer work in the hospital setting and they have pulled doctors from you know the, the wards the regular wards upstairs to help to help the manpower at ED um, I also have colleagues that are getting quite tired and quite burned out, I think. And um, they're off, sometimes they're off days or even they're not able to take leave anymore. There's a freeze. And so um, I think some on the ground, some of them are quite discouraged. Yeah. They're working very, very hard, um, but they're not sure when this is going to end and when they can actually get a break. Yeah. So you decided to help out? In a small way, I took time out for my family and for personal health reasons. Um, so now I, I decided to go and do some locuming to help out in the GP clinics. La. Is it because we've, we've really gone two months down into it and everyone's really exhausted, partly thinking when it'll end? Or is it the separation from their families in terms of worry? What, what do you find is really, really bearing on the mind of, of these healthcare professionals? Or is it actually just being worried for the sick? Or it's all of the above? I think it's all of the above, actually. Um, I think that everybody carries that fear. If not for ourselves, we are, we are young, We if we get COVID, we might get through it okay. But some of us have vulnerables at home, elderly parents, or even children. And I think that's the greatest fear, especially and people you're both, who... right? Yeah. <laughs> my, my parents are not that old, elderly, la, but my... Yeah, but... Uh, they have their own health conditions, yeah. And so I think that there is that sense of stress when people actually go uh, go to work. Uh, plus, there's been a lot of transition. Tell me, what do you think can be done by everybody else to help our healthcare professionals? It's not just the doctors who are at the front line, but we are all in this together, everyone in the community. Um, and while we go out, I mean, because we tend to be very industrious uh, people, you know, nation, yeah. so, um, and we need to do what we need to do. Yeah. Um, but we also have to bear in mind that the person standing next to us or behind us may have family members at home who are ill, who have lowered immunity because of medical condition or certain medication they are on. So even if we have very mild flu symptoms, cough for runny nose very mild that such individuals are recommended to stay at home yes. yeah yeah dr n is basically saying they have problems even before whether it's old people with lung issues or they've had cancers and they're on treatment life is still going on for them it was tough before covid it's tough now and for the kids um it, it, in short you know people with muscular skeletal problems and breathing difficulties, nervous, uh, nerve issues, they are already having problems struggling. And again, there are children that have got cancers and the parents are keeping them alive with doctor's help at home. They cannot afford to catch COVID. So please, please stay at home for these people's sake. They are vulnerable and they need our protection. If you're not, if you're not feeling well, in fact, if you're even concerned you came across a person with that, just stay at home. It will really help the rest of us. I know you've written a lot of po poetry, poems. Mm. Um, you wrote one specially for this situation. Would you like to share that with us? Uh, let me read it to you. Yes. Um, okay, the poem is <clears throat> it says, Quiet streets, quiet places, once buzzing with life, now quiet, bright lights shining, from windows of previously darkly lit homes, working in the office till late, home too tired to chat, busy, noisy, bus, 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 now homeschooling and a warm huddle over family meals, like a long lost reunion, heart to heart, time to connect once again. Quiet cold streets, warmly lit homes, the echoes of conversations, the human connection multiplies, living on, Zooming hangouts, no excuse not to meet. Crossing culture, crossing boundaries. Woven by the buzzing electronics of technology, the net which brings us closer together. Reaching across borders, hearts opening like flowers. Finally, a time to quieten down to care, 
to cry, to pray, to say to loved ones, how are you, keep safe, to zoom across the borders, across the world saying, how can we help, how can we help? One worldwide human family, human kindness seeping from the eyes of my patients, who seeing me decked in full PPE and say, keep safe doc, keep safe.